everyone for being here. All right, we are recording. Perfect. Got it. Uh, yeah, thank you for everyone who's here and also the people who are joining us on Zoom. So today uh, we are very pleased to receive a Dr. Catherine Maupin. She's a senior member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories. Her research focuses on model form error quantification and multi-objective surrogate modeling. Broader research interests include Bayesian methods, model validation, sensitivity analysis, and uncertainty quantification. Catherine joined Sandia as a postdoc in 2016 and converted to a staff position in 2018. She received her PhD in computational sciences, engineering and mathematics, and her master of science in computational and applied mathematics from the University of Texas at Austin. After completing her BA in applied mathematics at the University of California, San Diego, so she's been here. Uh, and when she's not working, Catherine spends her time playing with her two girls and three dogs. And today she will be talking about informing missing physics with model from er with model form error and model selection. So thank you, Catherine. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the the kind introduction and. Um, Thank you all for for giving me the opportunity to give this seminar, and you know, of course, thank you all for for being here, especially uh, later on a, a Friday afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to to share my experience and research with you guys. There we go. Okay, um, Sandia is the Department of Energy National Lab, so I'd like to to take a few slides to explain who we are and what we do. And then I'll share a little bit about my personal story of how I ended up working at a national lab. Um, and then I'll present some technical material, material about uh, the, the work that I'm doing in model discrepancy. And time permitting, I'll also discuss a project I'm leading on uh, multi-output surrogate construction. Um, so national labs sit somewhere between academia and industry. Um, much like academia, we do research and we have a little bit of flexibility in what we research. Um, we publish papers and we go to conferences. But on the other hand, we're structured a lot like a company with overarching uh, goals that really drive that research. So in addition to things like energy production and um, conservation, the Department of Energy oversees uh, policies and research around the handling of nuclear material. Um, but the, the Department of Energy sponsors more research in the physical sciences than any other federal agency. And most of that is done at the national labs. Um, the Department of Energy national labs are the largest scientific research system in the world. Uh, we're the product of the scientific research that contributed to our victory during World War II. And um, Sandia in particular was born of the Manhattan Project in developing atomic weapons. But since then, um, we've expanded into a, a multifaceted center of innovation. Uh, all of the labs work on you know, big and complex problems that require multidisciplinary teams. Um, so we provide high risk and highly innovative fundamental science that uh, helps ensure national security and drives US competitiveness in science and technology. Uh, these types of efforts have led to many scientific uh, discoveries and technological developments, such as advanced supercomputing, uh, confirmation of the Big Bang, mapping the human genome, and uh, advancements in wind power. We also serve the national interest by developing technology to detect explosives and manage the nuclear stockpile. Uh, there are 17 DOE national labs that are spread across the country. Sandia in particular has two locations, one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, to which I'm attached, and the other is in Northern California, just east of the Bay Area. Uh, this graphic shows the spectrum of foci that the national labs have. Um, some labs are very focused on a particular mission, such as physics or energy technology, and some are multipurpose. Uh, additionally, some labs focus more on science and others focus more on technology. So there's a little bit of something for, for everyone in there. Sandia in particular has a really broad spectrum of expertise. Um, as I've mentioned, we're a multifaceted and multi-purpose lab. 
I've heard of projects that range from like cognitive science to geology to nuclear physics and material science. Um, and all the projects that I have worked on are some mix of theoretical research, coding, and application. And I've generally been able to choose what mix of these three I have in my project portfolio um, in, every, in any given year. Uh, we are on soft money, which means that we do have to apply for funding and grants, but we don't typically have issues finding funding. I've never had a problem with it. Um, as a member of an underrepresented group, I appreciate that Sandia as an organization promotes a culture of um, respect and inclusion and diversity. We also encourage a healthy work-life balance. Um, Full-time employees get at least three weeks of vacation per year. This is, you know, in addition to holidays or PFL and, um, or paid family. Uh, and Sandia offers flexible work schedules. I'm on a 980 schedule, which means that instead of working eight hours a day, five days a week, I work nine hours a day and have every other Friday off. And they also recently uh, implemented a, what they call a 410 schedule where employees work 10 hours a day and have every Friday off. A little much for me, but some people like it. Um, especially during the pandemic, management has been pretty flexible on when those hours are worked, you know, due to, to daycare and school closures or needing to care for ill family members. Um, they've also developed a couple of new programs to help employ employees who need a little bit of extra time off through special vacation donation programs. So Sandia has systems in place that really help support that um, work-life balance. Uh, my favorite part about working at Sandia is that there are lots of really cool and exciting applications and research activities. Um, I've needed to learn how to say no to projects, not because they're not interesting, but just because if I said yes to every interesting project, my time would be way too fragmented. Um, when I am on a project, I'm always looking for, you know, those new research connections. So because research teams are interdisciplinary, I usually join a project as a dedicated um, validation or UQ or sensitivity analysis person. So making those connections doesn't always pan out, but um, lately it seems like my projects are really starting to cross paths and come, to, come together. And I think that's um, really exciting to see with that go. Uh, that said, I, I just want to do, you know, fun and exciting research. So having to do administrative tasks like timesheets and project reporting and performance evaluations are all kind of a drag. But I mean, honestly, that happens everywhere, not just at Sandia. So um, this was covered a little bit, but I'll just go through a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Cyprus, which some of you might know. It's in Southern California, just outside of L.A., um, as mentioned, I did my undergrad uh, down the street a little bit at UC San Diego. Um, at one point when I was there, I realized that I was in the last math class I would ever have to take, and it made me sad. So I decided to be a math major, but I also wanted to feel a bit grounded, so I went for applied math instead of pure math. Um, my junior year, I started working with a professor named Mike Holst, who became my undergrad advisor. I did a summer REU with him and wrote an honors thesis on that work um, for which I received honors with high distinction. And um, working with him greatly impacted my life path. He wrote me really strong letters of recommendation for grad school and nominated me for several awards, um, which are, are listed here among other honors. I did my graduate work at the University of Texas at Austin at the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary institute that's independent of any of the colleges or schools within the university. It's really its own little center. And my PhD is in computational science, engineering, and mathematics. Um, my advisor was Dr. Odin himself. And my dissertation was on Bayesian methods of model selection, calibration and validation with applications to coarse grain models of atomistic systems. After I graduated, I joined Sandia as a postdoc. Um, I'm part of the Center for Computing Research in the Optimization and Uncertain Quantification Department. Um, and my postdoctoral work was split between 
trying to make statistical model validation accessible to non-mathematicians and Dakota development. Um, Dakota is a code that's developed and maintained at Sandia that I'll, I'll touch on here in a couple of slides. So eventually I converted from a postdoc to my current position as a senior member of the technical staff, and I'm, I'm actually still in the same department. Um, now my research, is, my research focuses more on um, model discrepancy, which is also called model form error, and constructing multi-output um, physics constrained Gaussian processes for reducing the computational cost of um, solving highly complex physics problems. Uh, so as I mentioned, what I really like about Sandia is that I can apply my expertise in computational science to a variety of cool and challenging applications. Um, a couple of these projects have corresponded to physical experiments on Sandia's Z machine. A Z is pictured here on the top left. Um, is, it's the world's most powerful and efficient laboratory radiation source, and it's able to create extreme environments that are found nowhere else on Earth. Um, so that's where the plasma physics applications come from. I've also worked on projects involving uh, additive manufacturing, electro electromagnetics, material science, and uh, fluid dynamics, among others. Uh, so for the sake of avoiding this kind of happiness bias that seems to be relatively pervasive, um, and because most of you are students from what I understand, uh, I really wanted to you know, be honest with you guys about some of the struggles that I've had along the way. Uh, I don't want it to seem like my path has been all roses. Um, I'm the only child of a single mother. I never really saw this as a challenge. And you know, when I look back, I still don't. It was um, you know, just the way it was for me. And I never really knew any different. Um, and I know that situation is not unique, but you know, realistically speaking, that's some form of adversity. Uh, my mother was also chronically ill. Uh, from the time I was in elementary school, there always seemed to be some medical issue or another that she was dealing with. And since I was an only child and you know, she was divorced, it often fell on me to take care of her when she was sick. Uh, I think the hardest of those was about two weeks after I started grad school, she was diagnosed with cancer. Um, she underwent chemo and had multiple subsequent surgeries, you know, all while, while I was trying to find my footing as a graduate student. So I, I was living in Texas and I was trying to organize a support system for her, you know, halfway across the country back here in California. Um, so because of that, and you know, because grad school is just generally challenging, uh, I really str struggled in my first year. Um, I failed one of my prelim exams, but you know, I worked really hard and studied a lot and nailed it the following year, and here we are. Um, my conversion from postdoc to staff was non-trivial. So at Sandia, it's very common for postdocs to convert to staff positions. And um, I was very open from the very beginning with my manager that my intent was to convert to staff. Um, and I was given a list of goals to meet in order to do so. But then when it came time to start the process, um, I met most of those goals, granted not all of them, um, but I was most of them. And I was told that um, conversion to staff was not going to be possible. Um, so, this was a couple of years before COVID, but I was already working remotely from a different state at that point. And there was a long held belief by upper management that it was too difficult for a staff member to be successful while working remotely. Um, so I fought them on it. I presented my case to my manager and I had to do a formal interview with a seminar and one-on-one -on -one interviews with other staff members, the whole shebang. Uh, I know three other people who converted within about a year of me, and none of them had to do formal interviews. Um, my manager told me that he had never seen an interview with zero negative feedback until mine, and I was hired as a staff member about a week before my first daughter was born. Um, being a woman in science can also be very challenging. Uh, we face subtle and not so subtle sexism. And you know, you can replace that with whatever bias applies to you. I'm sure you've seen it. <laughs> um, 
we, I've had ideas dismissed and then presented later with fanfare and acceptance. I've been talked over during meetings. Um, when I was in graduate school, a professor told me that if I didn't go into academia, I may as well be a housewife. Um, and I think what's worse is that these experiences are relatively mild compared to some of the others that I've heard. Um, it's also difficult at times to compartmentalize and balance work with children. Women tend to be primary caretakers of children and other family members. Um, I don't think it's news to anyone that problems around that you know, social construct have really been exacerbated by COVID. Uh, but I would like to reiterate um, that Sandia is really great about that. They do encourage having a healthy work-life balance, um, but it can just still be challenging on a personal level um, to, to have that balance. Um, Sandia also encourages respect and inclusion, as I mentioned. So I haven't had any run-ins with overt sexism since I've joined the labs. Um, all of that's to say that it's okay to struggle. <laughs> if you are struggling, just please know that, you know, you're not alone and uh, please take advantage of whatever resources are available to you and get the help you need to be your best self. And just remember to just keep swimming. So despite the fact that it can sometimes be challenging to balance my work ethic with having kids, I do try to separate work from family time. Uh, I have two little girls. Um, Adele is 14 months old and Annette is almost three and they're just two peas in a pod. It's the cutest thing. Uh, we also have three rescue dogs. Zandra is a, a plot hound mix. Bud is a border collie lab mix and Johnny is a German shepherd mix. If you hear barking in the background, it's probably Johnny. <laughs> um, now I'll move on to the technical portion of my talk. So traditionally, there are two pillars of science, um, theory and experimentation. And these two inform one another and lead scientists to make educated guesses towards advancing science. However, recently, computation has emerged as a third pillar of science. Um, computation allows us to explore previously unattainable regimes, such as um, those at extreme scales. Oops, sorry about that getting a notice to, I don't know how to make this go away. Um, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> New computer. Um, okay, um, extreme scales, uh, very small or very large, uh, those in the irreproducible past and also those in the future. Uh, computation also allows us to perform experiments that are either costly or hazardous to perform. Uh, the goal of computational science as a whole is to make predictions in these extreme environments. More specifically, the goal we'll focus on today is um, making predictions under uncertainty. Um, this is central to high consequence model and simulation activities, such as those that we encounter at Sandia. Um, there are many sources of prediction uncertainty, including uncertainty in the model form, um, such as if there are multiple possible models, or if we need to use a lower fidelity model, or if we have incomplete physics knowledge. Uncertainty can also come from parameter estimation, measurement error, sparse data, um, and these uncertainties may either be known or unknown. The predictions that we're interested in making may either be interpolatory or extrapolatory. And extra Extrapolation in particular is notoriously risky without quantified uncertainty. So with this in mind, um, Dakota is a general purpose software toolkit that automates parameter variation studies such as um, model calibration, sensitivity analysis, and uncertainty quantification. Uh, Dakota allows users to provide a code and spe specify some computational need. Uh, it automates the process of changing the model parameters, running the model, and then reading the model responses to iterate that desired algorithm. Dakota is a research code, so um, it's constantly being improved and new algorithms are uh, constantly being implemented. 
uh, I use Dakota in all of my projects and it's the, the driver behind some of the examples that I'll show here today. So uh, let's assume that we have this expression for how the model output relates to the experimental data. In this expression, D is the data, M is our model, whether it be a computer model or a function. Theta are the model parameters to be calibrated. Uh, X are state or configuration parameters, which are not calibrated. They represent different experimental settings at which the data is taken, such as temperature or pressure. T uh, are the independent variables, such as time or space. And epsilon is the measurement error, which we assume to be normally distributed in IID. Um, for model calibration, the goal is to find the set of parameters that minimize the difference between the data and the model output. So we can rewrite this problem as an optimization problem. And this can then be solved with your favorite optimization or calibration routine. So even after calibration, it's often the case that the model does not adequately capture the experimental data. Um, this significant disagreement between the data and the model can be attributed to model form error, um, which can also be called model discrepancy, model inadequacy, or structural error. Uh, the seminal work by Kennedy and O'Hagan advocated the use of an external model discrepancy term, such as that shown here. Um, but it's also quite common to embed the discrepancy term inside the model. Uh, the, the presence of model discrepancy indicates that something is missing from a model. So um, this can be from a missing physics term or due to the use of a low fidelity or reduced order model uh, in place of an expensive high fidelity physics code. But in any case, typical model discrepancy approaches focus on constructing a corrected model that uses both M and Delta, and how to maximize the usefulness of that combined model. Uh, but in this work, we focus on using that discrepancy Delta to glean some insights as to how to improve M itself, rather than using a combined or corrected model. And in particular, we wanna investigate how we might be able to inform the physics that may be missing from a model. So to this end, we perform a sequential calibration in which the, the model parameters are calibrated first, followed by the discrepancy model parameters. Um, in a deterministic setting, the calibration process finds a single optimal set of model parameters that best fits the data. Um, this yields a single model prediction of the data, which is shown here with the single blue line. In a probabilistic setting, the calibration process finds a distribution of model parameters, um, all of which could possibly fit the data. This produces a corresponding distribution of model predictions. So typically this distribution is characterized by a mean prediction, which is again shown with the blue line and a shaded region, which captures the uncertainty in that predicted response. So we choose to do a probabilistic calibration using Bayes rule. Um, Pi of theta is a, called a prior distribution. It captures any prior information that's known about the parameters before calibration begins, um, while simultaneously acknowledging that that information is uncertain. Uh, ideally, we should use a maximum entropy prior, which maximizes the entropy or uncertainty in a distribution uh, subject to the constraints of our prior knowledge. However, it's extremely common to assume you know, uniform or normal prior distributions. Pi of d theta is the, it's called the likelihood distribution, and it's the likelihood that the parameters will be able to reproduce the data and captures any uncertainties in the model. Um, I've not yet come across an application that did not assume a Gaussian likelihood distribution. Pi of D is called the model evidence. Uh, in most cases, it's discarded as a normalizing constant, but it's critical in some analyses, including model selection, which I'll um, touch on here in a couple of slides. So through this formulation, the, the prior beliefs about the parameter values are updated by the data through the likelihood distribution um, to a posterior distribution of the parameter values. Now, ideally, we would take many samples of the posterior distribution 
and calculate the misfit between the calibration data and the model output for each of those samples. However, that's not always practical because the model may be very expensive to run. So instead we choose a representative point of the posterior distribution. Here we choose the maximum a posteriori or map point. This is the, the most probable value of the parameters after calibration. So we use the map to calculate the data model misfit and assuming this, the additive formulation I showed previously, we would have something that looks like this where theta hat uh, is the map point. Then these d deltas are used to calibrate the discrepancy function. Uh, in many model discrepancy or model form error analyses, we would calibrate a single discrepancy model and use the combined or corrected model for our predictions like I just mentioned. However, in this study, um, we suppose that we have a set of possible discrepancy models, each with its own likelihood and parameters. Uh, then we can write Bayes' rule uh, for the discrepancy model parameters in an expanded form to make explicit the dependence on the model discrepancy form delta J. So now, rather than discarding the evidence as a mere normalizing constant, we'll use it as the likelihood in what we call a higher form of Bayes' rule. Uh, in this new formulation, pi of delta j is the prior model plausibility, and it's the probability that model delta j is the best model before the calibration uh, process. In place of, in place of the likelihood, uh, we have the evidence from the calibration of the discrepancy model parameters. And now pi of d delta is another normalizing constant. All of this together yields uh, the posterior model plausibility. The model with the highest plausibility is the most plausible model and it's ranked the highest in the set. So let's, let's go through this process for an example here. The, the driving application is hypersonic reentry. So experimental data from a laminar hypersonic double cone experiment were provided to us by Calspan University at Buffalo Research Centers Large Energy National Shock Tunnel, UNS1. Um, our colleagues used this data to calibrate a hypersonic flow simulation code called SPARC. The model parameters are the free stream conditions, rho is equal to density, U is the velocity, and T is equal to temperature. And the, the quantities of interest are QOYs, where the um, P is equal to pressure, Q is the heat flux, H naught is the enthalpy, and P pitot is the pitot pressure. Um, so more information regarding the experiments and the calibration of SPARC can be found in a number of papers by Ray et al. Um, but the, the one that I have there on the bottom is their most recent paper. So during those calibration efforts, um, there revealed some discrepancy between the code and the experimental data. Here we'll focus on, on two of those calibration scenarios, which they call run six, those are the figures on top, and run seven. Um, due to the expense of running Spark, we constructed a, a Gaussian process surrogate model using output from previous Spark simulations, which consisted of about 400 samples. Um, we constructed one surrogate for each of our four QOIs. The model parameters were calibrated using Bayes' rule with uniform priors and a, a Gaussian likelihood. As calibration data, we included all four types of data. Um, for the heat flux and the pressure data, only the initial data points um, from the floor cone were used because that's the region of the cone where the physics are well understood. Um, but the entire heat flux and pressure data set will be used to calibrate the discrepancy model. For this problem in particular, we were advised to use a multiplicative discrepancy rather than additive. So our misfit takes on um, this functional form rather than the one that I showed earlier, but the process is the same. So when we do that, we get the following discrepancy data. Again, run six is shown on the top run seven is on the bottom, heat flux is on the left and pressure is on the right. Um, in both runs, the model is able to capture, or it's unable to capture the large spike that appears in both the heat flux and the pressure. Um, 
The surrogate for Run7 was also unable to capture the large dip in the heat flux. And in all of these cases, there seemed to be quite a bit of oscillatory behavior that isn't captured by the model. So we didn't have an initial guess at what physics might be missing. So we used a relatively standard set of functional forms. Just as a bit of a digression, uh, this approach could be used to prioritize which physics to add to a model if you have like an informed set to begin with. Uh, but we wanted to make this set in this process as general as possible with the idea that this might eventually be used in a toolkit like Dakota. Um, so uh, um, we used this set instead. After calibrating these, uh, it became apparent that we actually needed something that combined the Gaussian and the sinusoidal behavior. So we also ended up adding a Gauss plus trig to the list of possible models. Uh, the sync function that's shown there on the bottom looks very similar to Gauss plus trig, but it has fewer model parameters. Uh, after the discrepancy models were calibrated, their respective log evidences were calculated. Ideally, we would like to see the same model type selected for both runs, you know, for heat flux and for pressure. Uh, that would give us more confidence that the model form selected is due to some missing physics or some other pathological inadequacy in the model. And unfortunately, we don't see that here. But if we include the second and third best models, which are not too far off, then um, we see that SYNC and Gauss plus Trig are likely discrepancy model candidates. So at this point, we could go back to the physicists or the application experts and say, um, the physics you are missing will likely have one of these forms. Do you know of any physics that fits this? And when I went back and spoke with the application point of contact, we were told that uh, these results actually matched with what they suspect is missing from Spark. Uh, for these figures, the two left columns show the results for run six. I'll start there. The leftmost column shows how well the proposed discrepancy model matches the calculated discrepancy. And beside that, we have the corrected model at the map point compared to the experimental data. The uncertainty bands in these figures only include the, the discrepancy model uncertainty. Uh, the results for sync are shown on top and the results for trig plus gauss are shown on the bottom. For run six, we can see that the peak is pretty well captured. We don't nail it exactly, but we get, we get pretty close. Uh, both models are also able to capture those oscillations that we see uh, before and after the peak. The same general figure setup applies to run seven, where we have the discrepancy on the left, data on the right, um, sync on top, trig plus gas on the bottom. And the experimental setup in this particular scenario is close to the edge of the reliable region for Spark. And the surrogate model was actually rather poor to begin with. So the results are not nearly as great as they are for Run 6, but they were still shocked that we were able to do this well, particularly with the trig plus gauss. So again, we have the same general figure set up, but now um, we're looking at the pressure instead of the heat flux. And actually, these results are a little bit better. Um, again, we were able to get pretty close to the true peak value, as well as some of that oscillatory behavior before and after. Um, there's some notion of parsimony or, or Occam's razor that's built into the calculation of the evidence. So if we have two models that match the data just as well, um, if they, so if they yield the same misfit or likelihood value, the model with the fewer parameters will be ranked higher. And I believe that's what we're seeing here. Uh, it seems that trig plus Gauss actually performs a bit better than sync, but sync is likely ranked higher due to the fact that it has about half the number of model parameters. Uh, so just a summary for this portion, uh, we combined a model discrepancy with model selection to develop a methodology for identifying missing physics, uh, which we successfully applied to a laminar hypersonic double cone experiment. Thinking ahead, we would like to be able to extrapolate that information to new scenarios for Spark in the double cone. Uh, we're also working on automating that process of um, discrepancy model selection and implementing that in Dakota. 
uh, since I have a bit of time, I'd also like to discuss some recent and very new work that my colleagues and I have been working on, on multi-output uh, surrogates construction for fusion simulations. Uh, the overall goal of this particular project is to address the fundamental scientific challenge of reducing the computational cost of calibrating and using for prediction validated models that represent complex physical systems in the presence of uncertainty. So to do this, we're developing a robust Bayesian data simulation framework that's capable of integrating theory and modeling with data at the core of which are computationally efficient and accurate physics constrained data informed surrogate models with quantified uncertainty. As a motivating application, we're considering an inertial confinement fusion concept called MAGLIF, uh, which stands for Magnetized Linear Inertial Fusion. This particular type of experiment relies on the compression of a magnetized laser heated fuel to achieve thermonuclear ignition. Uh, this process was actually developed at Sandia and experiments are performed on the Z machine. So experiments start with the cylinder of preheated deuterium fuel surrounded by a magnetized solid beryllium liner, and then the system is compressed to achieve ignition. Now, as you might imagine, uh, it's difficult to directly observe and measure the state of a plasma. So physicists rely on magnetohydrodynamics codes or MHD codes to calculate diagnostics to infer the state of the fuel in order to understand things like the target performance, the impact of modifications, and the importance of sources of degradation. So when we consider the system as a whole, calibrating those MHD diagnostics becomes a multi-objective inference problem. Um, the ultimate goal here is to extrapolate our understanding of the current pulse power technologies to a facility that produces yields orders of magnitudes higher than, than those currently produced. So this exemplar uh, demonstrates several key challenges that are common to modeling and simulation applications. Um, so again, we'll call upon Bayesian model calibration since it naturally incorporates the many uncertainties inherent to computational modeling. Um, after the parameter values are updated, the posterior distribution can then be sampled and propagated to provide predictions with uncertainty estimates. Um, however, as I mentioned, uh, both the, the calibration and the propagation phases require many runs of the model and occur, incur significant computational expense. This can be mitigated through the use of surrogate models. Um, but even for modeling scenarios with multiple outputs, the current standard of practice when using surrogate models is to use individual phenomenological surrogates for each observable, which is actually what I did in the, in the double cone example. We constructed four separate surrogates for each of our quantities of interest. Um, this is not always problematic, but the correlation between those QOIs is lost, both in the calibration phase and in the prediction phase. So predicting multiple quantities of interest with a single surrogate would preserve the valuable insights regarding the, the correlated behavior of those target observables, and it would maximize the information we're able to gain from available data, which is particularly important if the data is limited. So this is really the motivation behind the development of a co-predictive surrogate. So the, the overall goal for this project is to construct a co-predictive surrogate model. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with Gaussian processes. Um, I mentioned them a couple of times, just kind of breeze through, but I'll, I'll briefly review here just to make sure that we're all on the same page. A Gaussian process or a GP is a stochastic proce process such that every finite collection of its random variables has a multivariate normal distribution. So if we look at this um, figure, which I shamelessly stole from this Rasmussen and Williams book, um, if you take a vertical slice and you kind of turn it sideways, you'll see a normal distribution. The covariance matrix sigma is completely defined by the correlation function k which is typically either a squared exponential or a matern function. 
GP surrogates are very popular because they interpolate the data, the data points and provide uncertainty estimates for each output value. A relevant detail here is that the computation of the prediction mean and variance requires the inversion of an n by n correlation matrix, where n is your number of build points. So this scales as O of n cubed. So we run up against the curse of dimensionality relatively quickly as we um, increase our number of build points. We want to extend this formulation for multi-output Gaussian processes or MOGPs. So in this case, F is now a vector of outputs with T observations. So our mean is also a vector and our covariance function contains correlation information across the build points and across the outputs. Uh, this multi-output covariance matrix uh, K has T times T minus one covariance functions that express the covariance for each observable, as well as those interdependencies. And again, these Ks are often either squared exponential or matern functions. Uh, so now the computation of a prediction mean and variance requires the inversion of an NT by NT correlation matrix. So computational issues such as ill-posedness and dimensionality are exacerbated when we're considering multiple outputs. Most of the existing multi-output uh, GP methods revolve around clever ways to exploit the structure of that matrix and the covariance functions um, in order to break it down into more manageable chunks. And uh, I'll show three such methods, which all start with the same general formulation. So if we suppose we have Q covariance functions, and for each one we sample our Q latent functions, which we call U. Um, then we can write out each output function as a linear combination of these latent functions. Uh, the cross covariance is then given by um, another linear combination where there, those AQs contain the RQ coefficients. Uh, the AQ times AQ transpose creates a matrix BQ, which is called the co-regionalization matrix. There are two special cases here. Um, if we set Q equal to one, we have the intrinsic co-regionalization model or ICM. And if RQ is equal to one, we have the semi-parametric latent factor model or SLFM. Uh, the formulations shown on the previous slide can then be updated, which I've summarized here in this table of equations. So just a few things to note here. Um, the KQs can be the same function with different hyperparameters or completely different function types. So perhaps all of the KQs are squared exponentials uh, with different correlation lengths, or perhaps some of them are squared exponential and some are matern. Also, the larger Q is, the more flexibility the approximation has. Um, there's been some work on how to optimize Q, and it, it's been shown that you really don't gain very much if Q is larger than T. And then, you know, of course, again, the larger Q is mean it, the larger your computational cost, which tends to be true about pretty much everything we do in computational science. So we don't have maglev data yet, but I'm, I'm told it's eminent. Um, but we do have data for a similar experiment that's performed at NIF, which is the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, the setup is very similar to maglev but without the magnetic field around the outside. So we have a, a cylinder or a tube of fuel and a laser is being shot down the center. Uh, as the laser is deposited, it creates a shock waves throughout the plasma. And Visar is a diagnostic tool that measures those shocks that occur during these experiments. We have a 1D realization of these experiments, which is simulated using a code called Hydra. Um, which is also developed at, at Lawrence Livermore. As inputs, we have the laser parameters, the deposition radius, temperature, and the length of time. Uh, we sample these parameters from the ranges that are shown here, and we run Hydra to produce the desired outputs. As outputs, we have the deposited energy, which is um, where the, the blue line levels off on the top graph, uh, the arrival time of the main shock, which is uh, the time at which the vertical line occurs and the delta velocity of the main shock, which is basically how high that curve jumps. 
from the, the correlation matrix on the bottom left, we can see that the three QOIs are very strongly correlated. So the arrival time is strongly negatively correlated with the other two, and the um, deposited energy and the delta velocity are pretty strongly positively correlated. Um, and just as a note, if any of these correlations were close to zero, it would probably be beneficial to break that QOI off into a single output GP to reduce computational complexity. Um, I have a few flip throughs here as we increase the number of build points. Um, we had a total of 340 data points and P in the figure um, indicates the percentage of data points that we use as build points. In the figures, we show box and whisker plots of the, the errors for the surrogate options of each of the three QOIs. Um, we were able to eliminate SLFM as an option in a benchmarking study. It was pretty consistently more expensive and less accurate than ICM and LMC. So I've only included the results for those two algorithms here. And um, I have, I also included a comparison to the single output GPs. So in this example, uh, LMC performs the best. Uh, there may be one or two graphs where it has a higher error than the single output GP. And ICM is kind of hit or miss on whether or not it outperforms the, the single output GPs. Not unexpectedly, the single output GPs are cheaper than ICM and LMC um, because of that difference between the N versus NT um, build size but recall that they don't contain the correlation information between the QIs. So that's really what we gain with the, the multi-output GPs. Um, so just to summarize this portion, uh, I presented an example to compare a class of methods for calibrating multi-output GPs. Of these three, ICM and LNC are favorable over SLFM. And the Visar example pretty clearly showed that LMC outperforms the single output GPs. There are a few immediate next steps that we have planned for this coming FY. Um, we want to extend this methodology to field data. The, the Visar example features multiple scalar outputs, but we've been discussing how we might extend that methodology to data that is either time or space dependent. We'll also be incorporating physics constraints, which will again you know, complicate the, the computational and numerical considerations. Uh, we want to um, include information from causal statistics to ensure that critical physics and variables are captured in the surrogate model. And um, then, of course, we want to be able to use the surrogate in a Bayesian calibration and validation framework. So uh, with that, I'll, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, while I take questions, I'll leave this slide up that has some information about internship opportunities at a few of the national labs and Sandy is down there at the bottom. Uh, all right, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, do we have any questions here in the room or via Zoom? Yeah, we have a question. Uh, do I speak loudly? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, in the very beginning of your talk, when you gave the framework that theta equals the model plus your error return, you said mm -hmm. if error is normally distributed. Yes. Um, have you, it seems possible that if you're missing a physical term in your model, that maybe that error distribution assumption might be um, violated? I was wondering, have you explored using the error to maybe inform what might be the thing as like a first step? Or have you looked at that at all? Um, so let's see, you're talking about kind of the confounding between the model discrepancy term and the error term. Yeah. Yeah, so that's always a concern. And, you know, these calibrations get very messy. So there's the confounding between um, the model discrepancy term and the what we assume to be the error term, there's confounding between the calibration parameters and the model discrepancy parameters. Um, and the, so we would like to argue that by taking a sequential calibration step by 
uh, calibrating the model parameters first and then calculating the or calibrating the discrepancy function, it kind of mitigates some of that confounding between the parameters and the, the various sources of uncertainty, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess um, more specifically, if you use the confounding as information mm. from the I guess that's what, what I was asking. Okay. So given that, try your try your question again. I'll see if I can get it the second time. So when you calibrate your model before you add the um, discrepancy uh, function in there, mm -hmm. if you examine your error first for the missing piece of information they were hoping the discrepancy function might find, and if you kind of did that dance where you looked for information in the error before you started, before you ran the various discrepancy uh, functions that you tried out. Um, I think so, but I think that's part of what we're we're trying to do, right? Unless I'm misunderstanding your question. Um, so are you talking more about like um, how to detect whether or not that error is actually a functional form versus just random statistical error? Yeah, I guess. So like if you Look at your error, you can sum normally distributed if it's you know like a Poisson distribution, or you plot it against the data and you see maybe like the sine wave in your error. If you can then like take that and be like, oh, I kind of know where to start now with my next step. I see, I see. Um so yeah, we've we've talked a little bit about we've had some discussions about these automated methods for um error detection, but we haven't gotten very far in those because it's difficult to answer in a very general setting. Usually it's one of those things, if you if you see it, then you know it. Um, but so, and it's also, um, I think important for the, whoever is doing the modeling or for the applications experts to be able to contribute some initial guesses as to what those model forms may be for your discrepancy model. In this example, we just kind of went in blind and, and chose a set, um, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Yeah, but maybe you can also another question before me. Uh, Someone on Zoom. Uh, I don't see. Uh, in the in the yeah. Oh, yeah, I have a question here. So, so if I understand correctly, uh, you have some uh, assumption, uh, a prior distribution of, of the model pr parameter, and you're trying to update your um, model uh, parameter distribution based on discrepancies between your data and the model prediction, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering how does this um, Bayesian inference approach compare with, with, with uh, another branch of uh, method, which is the gradient-based method? Because some people would use the discrepancy between the data and the model to calculate the gradient of the parameter to update them. So the, the, are these two actually related? So um, they are pretty, well, the, so they are related. Um, the approach that we usually <laughs> use for Bayesian calibration is MCMC. So um, oh, Markov yeah. chain Monte Carlo. So it's the implementation of Bayes isn't, doesn't always use those um, that gradient information, although there are some mm -hmm. methods that do. Yeah. Um, and you can inform your initial point for MCMC using like a, a pre-solve or a pre-optimization using something like a gradient-based algorithm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thanks. Catherine, can you hear me? Hear me? Yes. Fine. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so first of all, thank you for sharing your, your life experience in the first minute. <laughs> and and the, the question, the technical question is related with, with this caution and assumption. And, and, and I can tell you my experience last year, I was conducting a research trying to derive an uncertain, a, a, a universal uncertainty model, a global uncertainty model. Uh, for simpler topography obtained from satellite data, from gravity data. Okay. Uh, as common, 
in, in topography or even in earthquakes. I also have, have been working a, a little bit with earthquakes. In the measurements, typically the problem is that you are not capturing a smaller scale until a certain threshold that you have in your measurement. And for example, when you are having this kind of, of topography or earthquake or turbulence, you typically can model or you can see that you have the behavior of a fractal behavior in the process that you are measuring. And that means that you are missing some, some, some smaller scales that you can see that they have that kind of characteristic fractal behavior with the power law. What I could see when I was comparing the model from the satellite with real data, real measurements in different places around the world, I could get the distribution of the error. Okay. And, it, and as it is common in fractal, in fractal processes, you can see that they actually the distribution of those error or those smaller scales are actually non Gaussian at all, are typically have very heavy data. Uh, for example, in my case, I could match a very nice exponential distribution to, to the errors I was getting everywhere in the world, yeah, trying my different seas and different oceans. So after this long description, my question is, uh, if you take your methodology, can you, for example, uh, change from this uh, simple Gaussian distribution to something completely different, for example, an exponential or, or just the, the, the the actual distribution you can get, for example, from a calibration. So it sounds like um, uh, you're uh, objecting to using a Gaussian likelihood in all cases, which, I mean, I'm glad that there's at least one example where it's not Gaussian. Um, but so I would say that in your case, it sounds like you would use an exponential or some other distribution for your your likelihood distribution, um, which makes the so because we're using Markov chain Monte Carlo, it will incorporate the the functional form of you know whatever distribution you choose to use. Um, did you well? I'm thinking. Did it uh, affect the way that? Like that, I'm thinking about the interaction between like an exponential distribution with uh, your prior distribution and how that would probably complicate things quite a bit um, in terms of the convergence. It might um, it might take a while for it to converge. Actually, which what, is we, what we did at the end to solve that problem because when I was finally building my uncertainty model, of course, I was everything everything was based in the Gaussian distribution because it's much easier. To build, for example, samples of the random field by using a unit of expansion and all that stuff. But in, as a last step, sacrificing a little bit of the accuracy, we finally translate or scale the, the sample by using just some mapping, and you could get finally the, any desired marginal distribution you wanted. But in that process, you were sacrificing a little bit on the accuracy of the covariance matrix that you were obtaining from your problem. Sure. And also, you were having some implications in the conditional, in the, in the, in the Bayesian framework, because basically the conditional is not the same as a Gaussian when you are translating to, to something else. So, we were doing that practice, but at some point, we are not 100% sure about how much we are losing when we are, we, are, we are using that step to change it from Gaussian to, to, to something completely non Gaussian, which is kind of something else. Always positive, but still having some errors. So, yeah, and I was wondering if maybe there is a better method in order to do that instead of using that translation method that we were using. Which is, for example, your approach. Yeah. Um, so, well, did you try like a more traditional MCMC without doing a transformation first? No, no, no. Maybe that is the first step. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so in that case, because so I would expect with an exponential distribution that the um, convergence, like I said, would be much more difficult. Um, so that's where something like using combining it with a, um, a gradient based pre solve of some sort. Um, would probably be very helpful or even doing 
you could do like a, we call it a multi-start where you have several different points that you start, um, that you start your Markov chain from uh, when you do your calibration to make sure that you're not falling into like a, a local energy min as opposed to doing a global one. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Um, there is a hand there. Oh, there's a hand? Where? Oh, uh, yeah. When? Do you want to just unmute yourself? There you go. Uh, sure. Uh, hello, Dr. Malpan. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. I just wanted to ask, I was curious, so these problems you've applied, these methods to are mostly physics problems. Mm -hmm. Do they also, do you also apply them to like biology problems? I, I, I know Sandia does have some work in bio, computational biology. Uh, so we do, I haven't, so I haven't, personally participated in any biology based problems, but I do know some people who um, focus more in that area. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of very specific examples, but I don't, um, I think I can send you some names if you email me of people who do more specific biology things. I was just wondering if these methods you You've, you've shown us, do, do they use those in biological problems or are they just too messy for this kind of thing? Oh, well, um, no, I've seen them used. It depends on how you, you know, define your, your model um, and define your covariance likelihood, all of your distributions. Um, so I think I've seen a couple, I've seen a couple of talks at a few conferences recently that have to do with like COVID modeling. Um, so like general infectious disease type modeling. Um, and actually uh, the person I sat next to in grad school did a Bayesian calibration for brain tumor modeling. And Dr. Odin also does a lot of cancer modeling now. Um, but it, it does tend to be very messy from yeah, what I, I imagine, understand. I imagine so. <laughs> I was just wondering if they, they use these things as well, so. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, so we have, yeah, we have another question here from Sachi. Yes, and my name is Sachi, I can travel another question. Sure. I wanted to know how you distribute your Calibration points that is, you have a sequential calibration for not model parameters and your discrepancy. Have you looked at are there better points? That is, I would assume when you want to do model parameter calibration, you want to have some kind of robustness of allocate those points and regions where the physics is less sensitive to the scatter and the parameters. Whereas when you want to get discrepancy, you want the opposite, you want them to be very sensitive, right? Uh, so how did, how, did, how did you do it and are there methods of optimally allocating those Yeah, so um, for the re-entry problem, we didn't have a choice <laughs> in what, what points we were given because they were all previ from previous calibration or previous simulations. Um, we just kind of took what we were given. For the, um, the maglev problem, we will have some more choice. I think we'll start with LHS, flat and high cube sampling, uh, just because that seems to be our bread and butter. And that's what I use the most often actually, but there are me other methods where you can, um, I actually implemented an algorithm in Dakota that's called, um, they call it high to low. So what you do is you have a, an expensive high fidelity code and a less expensive lower fidelity code and you know you train the low fidelity code on a couple of build points and then you can measure if you have some proposed um, new points at which you want to run your more expensive model or you know do an experiment um, it's more of an experimental design thing then you can calc you calculate the mutual information between um, the the data that you get from your high fidelity code and the, the data that you would be getting from your experimental design to see which 
experiment, or I'm sorry, which of those possible design points would maximize the information gain that you get for your parameters. Um, so there's a lot of information theory that, that goes into that process. Is that kind of along the lines of what you're thinking? Yeah, kind of. So is the multi-output calibration a part of Dakota? Um, the, the high to low? Yeah. It is, yeah. Thank you. Do we have more questions? So what are the questions that we have? Well, I do have some questions as well. So, I'm gonna, um, so when you introduce the discrepancy, it is something that you add to the model, like the thing that you're missing. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, but then uh, in the example that you show about reentering tables, that's something that you multiply to your model. Right. So, what kind of insight was already there? So, my question is like, if I have a model that isn't describing the data, what can I? How can I know? Oh, is it something that I need to add, or is it something that I need to multiply? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um. So, if so we were for that particular example, we will we were told don't bother with additive. We know it's multiplicative. Um, and I don't I don't think they ever told us exactly why that was the case. <laughs> um, but what you could do is test multiple um, methods for calibration. So kind of extend this framework of of model selection to include both additive function types and multiplicative ones. That, that was actually going to be my next. So can I test them both the same way that I said that you just tested multiplicative ones? Yeah. And you compare them equally and see which one gives you the best? I think so. Um, I would, yeah, I can't think of a reason why not. So if you look at the, um, the I'm thinking about this functional form um, for the, the model evidence, uh, it depends on the, the calibration data being the same. So I think if you have, it might be cheating a little bit to do like a, the multiplicative ones and comparing those to additive, um, but I think you could make some arguments around the general expression if like you replace this D delta with just your um, original experimental data and include the formulation there. I think you can make the um, the philosophical arguments work out if that makes sense. Sounds great. Uh, what other questions do we have? Either here in the room or people who are joining us remotely. Well, just one last question. Uh, when you took, we introduce uh, sort of your path and you talk about how even before COVID, you were already working remotely, and yeah. people, the uh, administration wouldn't believe that staff could do work efficiently. Has that changed now that everybody had to work remotely? Uh, I think some people are still a little bit resistant to it, um, thinking that you know it'll come to an end eventually. <laughs> um, but I think they're they've been forced to be much more open about it, and I know um, a few people who have moved to complete um we call we distinguish between teleworkers who are able to go into the office if they need to versus virtual workers who aren't um so i don't live in albuquerque at all or new mexico um and so there um i know people who have moved to virtual work as opposed to telework even during covid um and sometimes it's resisted and sometimes not it just kind of depends on your manager and i think the projects that you're working on too to make sure that you know your team is collaborative enough oh, all right that's great so it seems like we don't have any more questions so thank you catherine for thank you guys i appreciate it we really appreciate your thoughts and thank you everyone else for being here. And we're going to thank the host because we're going to thank the speaker to Eureka for being here. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll have a drink on Catherine's uh, place. <laughs> everyone. Thank you guys.